Welcome, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host, Steve Zerker. I'm a professor of management and dean at Kansai Gaidai University. Uh, this show, we take a look at various topics, issues, trends uh, in Asia and uh, discuss them uh, over the course of uh, half an hour or so. Today, uh, I've picked a, a popular media topic, uh, a phenomenon that's going on worldwide that uh, probably most of you who are listening to this or viewing this know about. It's a Korean Netflix drama uh, called The Squid Game. And we're going to explore what this is <clears throat> and uh, why it's become so popular and what the ramifications of it are. And we have a very special guest, an expert in this area, uh, Dr. Ingyu Oh, Professor Oh, who also works at uh, Kansai Gaida University. He's a professor of popular culture, teaches classes in that area and also in, in the business area. Has his PhD from the University of Oregon, <clears throat> his master's degree from Oregon State, and his undergraduate degree from Roosevelt University. So um, I've worked with uh, Professor O, or I'll, I'll just call you Ingu like we do normally, um, on hosting various popular media conferences and seminars in Korea, and uh, we had some plans also in Japan. So he's an acknowledged expert in this area. So Ingu, thank you so much for uh, participating in the show today. I, I look forward to this discussion. Well, thanks for inviting me today, uh, Steve, and it was really uh, great to have a chance to talk about this uh, movie or uh, rather drama. And uh, I, I, I will explain everything that I know today, probably. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, for our viewers, um, we talked before the show started about how much to address the actual content. Because uh, on the one hand, we don't want to do spoilers, but on the other hand, this... Uh, drama has been so incredibly popular that the basic plot and uh, video clips and so forth are, are all over the internet. Um, so we're going to talk about the program in some detail, just as a warning for those of you that have not seen it. Maybe you don't want to watch the rest of the show, but for the rest of you, if you have, please stay tuned. So why don't we start there, Ingu? Why don't you tell us what, what is this program? <clears throat> what's going, uh, what, what's it about? <clears throat> Well, this is a what we call K drama or Korean drama, uh, which has been a boom all over the world since uh, early since the early two thousand. And uh, this Korean drama is a new boom these days because of what we know, or what we now call the Netflix system or over the top system of uh, content distribution worldwide using. Uh, you know, fast internet. Uh, so, so the drama is a nine episode series and uh, it is basically about two things. One is money and the other one is violence. And uh, people... Uh, Ingu, that sounds, like an, <clears throat> that's, that sounds like an American drama. <laughs> exactly. It's a, it's a universal theme, uh, money and violence. And, uh, mm. But uh, like its previous um, big sensation from Korea, it was about 10, 15 years ago, there was a, a movie called Old Boy uh, from Korea that had this exactly similar uh, concept, that is money, uh, woman, and, uh, and violence, and, but particularly a lot of violence and a lot of blood scenes, you know. So that's... Uh, but but again, the blood scene is, uh, is is very different from American Hollywood blood scenes because they don't use guns, but they use knives and other types of feasts and you know strangling and other kinds of stuff. So violence, very violent. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, what the movie is all about. And uh, but again, it's very popular and attractive because it's about money and it's about how poor people can become uh, rich people overnight. So it's a you know. Pretty much universal thing, uh, wherever you go. Wow, so it, it includes a rags to riches element as well. The drama was based on a uh, very successful manga and anime uh, in the 1990s and 2000s in Japan. And uh, it was developed into a movie as well. And uh, 
the, the topic is the same thing. There are poor, a bunch of poor people applying for this uh, jackpot money. If they succeed and survive throughout the you know trail the games they have to play, and in, so, in, do, in doing so, they, there are violences. They have to kill each other in the, in the competition to get the money. So, so the, the theme is there, and it was originally uh, in, in the Japanese mass media and in the film industry. It was a very worldwide popular theme, uh, what would you call uh, death game uh, topic or death game theme. Mm-hmm. And uh, so young people and, you know, even mid-age people love this because they've been playing games for many, many decades throughout their oh, lives. Oh, I see. So this is pretty much about game stuff. So I'm talking about violent games. So uh, it, uh, the Japanese movie was very successful, and Japanese manga was even more successful. So the Koreans decide to, you know, make it much, you know, more fancier, more trendy to be, a, you know, more global in the sense that uh, what in the sense that Netflix likes it uh, because it's more global. It's not Japanese, but more global, not Korean either. So. It's a sort of globalized Asian uh, drama content about games, violence, and uh, and life, comment, uh, so-called the rap to rich type of you know uh, reverse male Cinderella type of story. A couple of things that I uh, picked up as I was researching this is the impact this drama is having worldwide. Uh, in the drama, the uh, poor people who are competing at the risk of death for riches all wear this white shoe, and it's a particular brand. And that brand's sales of shoes in, uh, in America and worldwide has gone up by 1,000%. Uh, maybe I would imagine the Squid Game costumes are going to be the most popular costume for upcoming Halloween in uh, in Japan, where it's celebrated. And, of course, America, it's just huge Halloween for adults now. When I was a kid, it was uh, focused on children. Now Halloween is all about adults. And the other thing, too, I, I read that Korean studies, an interest in studying Korean, has jumped by 80% as well in the last few months because of this drama. So... My son, as you know, in US, is, has been studying Korea for about Korean for about six months or so. But I'm, I'm glad he's lined up his teacher because I'm sure Korean teachers are very, very popular. Just a couple examples of the commercial success of this. <clears throat> now, I know you've watched it. Uh, you watched all nine episodes. Did you do that in one sitting? Did you binge watch it or did you watch it over time? What, how would you recommend that our viewers actually well, look it, at this? It's very, well, it's very uh, viral. Uh, it's very attractive. And it's you know it's very addictive, so you cannot stop in the middle. So it's been you watching <laughs> the common trend because you know they stop in the middle of you know major crisis or climax, which continues every episode. So every episode is like one climax in there. So you don't want to stop it in the middle, expecting to have another climax next. But which so did you watch all all nine episodes in a row? To, tonight. <laughs> Two nights, <laughs> but I'm sure there are many people who have just watched it all in one city. Is it are each each episode's an hour long? Uh, yeah, about okay, about so hour. nine hours. All right, Inge, we uh, we just got a question coming in uh, through the chat here, and I don't know if you can see it or not. So I'm going to go ahead and if you if you would uh, allow me, I'm going to read it. It's from Greg P. Gregory Frey. So he's already watched all episodes of the Netflix show Squid Game. I wonder, as I compared it to many fairly similar types of themes, now these are Western themes, The Running Man, Gladiator, Spartacus, any show which suggests that the unhappy masses need to be calmed and the way to do it is to bring them together to watch others compete and suffer as a result. Yeah, so yeah, Spartacus comes to mind, Gladiator comes to mind. <clears throat> Why anyone would have volunteered when given the three symbols business card? I guess that's part of the Squid Game. Is this a cultural reaction or attraction in Korea or in Asia, which makes the ask realistic and likely of success? This kind of addresses what, what I was thinking about is the uh, e- income inequality 
that's highlighted through the Squid Game. Thank you. What What do you think? Is Is that uh, a theme that you think resonates uh, across the world because of Gini coefficient differences and income inequality? I, uh, at, uh, you know, uh, uh, the original movie, original manga had the same inequality problem as a motivation of the whole story. So mm -hmm. it motivates people to participate, especially in poor people who have really no hope. They try everything to get out of this game, uh, but they have to return. The point is you have to return to the game because you're given a chance to escape in the beginning, but then you have to return. That's the secret part of this whole attraction. So uh, the, the reason People, when, when what people watch, it doesn't matter whether you're Korean, Japanese, Chinese, or American, or French. As long as you watch that, you can fairly easily understand the logic why about why they have to come back to the game despite the freedom they experienced uh, after the first release from the sort of you know concentrated camp type of island. But uh, the reason is very simple because you you ran out of every option of your life. So you, you got two choices, basically. Go back to the game or commit suicide. So it's all human universal feeling. You don't want to kill yourself. You, you want to at least try one last time. So that one last time is going back to the game spot. So the people <clears throat> who are watching this, uh, in the United States, 50% uh, of the population is living paycheck to paycheck. Um, yeah, and the poverty rates in, in Japan are, have been going up uh, before COVID, but have been accelerated through the last couple of years in COVID. I think that's true, as you mentioned, worldwide, all of the countries. So many people who are viewing this are in the situation of the poor people in the drama that are competing for the money. I, I, I find it interesting that uh, half the population base or half the people who are watching the Squid Game could be in it. Potentially. Well, I want to make a, a distinction here between absolute poverty and relative poverty. poverty. The, the poverty, the Japanese manga and the Korean drama, the Squid Game are depicting is not about absolute poverty you find in Africa or some other, you know, underdeveloped or developing countries. It is hmm. a wealthy country where people are relatively well to do, but they have a dream which they cannot capture without a lot of money. So as long as, so, in other words, in that sense, you are relatively poor. In, in other words, in, I want to go to America, uh, but I don't have money for that. So therefore, I'm poor. So I want to play that game. So game starts as like a trivial game. It's like, that's a luck, you know, play the luck, play my luck, you know, try my luck at least. Hmm. So you don't have to really do that. But as long as you're in the game, which I think is a, which resonates with the whole social, you know, social structure of rich countries, you don't have to really work hard. Uh, you can survive. You're not going to be really absolutely poor. You're, going to, you're not going to starve to death. But we are trying to survive. We are working hard. We compete with each other in our normal social setting, even if we are relatively well-to-do because we think we want to be more like a millionaire. We want to be more like, you know, uh, the, the famous and rich and famous of our society. So that is the underlying thing. So if I, if anybody sees this movie from like a really poor country like Haiti, Haiti, they will not understand the whole structure. Why do they have to do that, right? Because mm -hmm. we Haitians don't have anything to eat, right? So. Right. Uh, so we have to really understand this, that this is about relative poverty and people are not starving to death, but they have a huge dream that needs a lot of financing to do. That's, uh, that's very insightful, Ingyu. I, I, I can see that. So it's, it's relative poverty. And uh, the, the program um, reinforces the theme of, of upward social mobility, even though the facts are that upward social mobility is limited in Korea and limited in Japan and limited in France and limited in the United States. All the data shows that. But people still dream about that. And exactly. I guess this, this drama is showing that, uh, well, it's, it's a fiction, but people would risk their lives in order to move up to the higher level within their developed economy, whether it's Korea or Japan or China or France or Germany or Brazil or wherever. 
So that I think I, that's a very important insight and would explain why this show is so popular in developed in the developed world. <clears throat> it resonates yeah. with the people in the developed world. Developed world, not not in the really starving poor you know countries. Yeah, I agree. I've been to Africa, and the poverty level there is is uh, beyond anything that uh, you can really imagine as coming from America or Korea, and they would. They would not relate to this at all. I agree with you because it was—it would just be pure fiction, pure fantasy, exactly. not something that you you would think is maybe possible. All right. So um, another thing <clears throat> we wanted to talk about is is what this will lead to. You know, when Sai came out with his Ganyam style, uh, and you know there were three billion downloads. All of a sudden, people were exposed to Korean music, that the song was in Korean, the Squid Game is in Korean, that doesn't seem to have prevented this program from being wildly popular internationally. What do you think the knock-on effects would be of the worldwide success of this drama? I, as you pointed out, uh, Korean dramas have had international success before, but there has been nothing like this. This is Netflix's most popular show ever. It's number right, one. But, but, but if you remember uh, Parasite uh, two years ago, uh, who, which won four Academy Awards, right? It's a four. That's a, a sensational record for Korean uh, movie industry or movie history in general. So, so Koreans are doing really well these days in terms of popular culture, films, dramas, and pop music, K-pop music. So it has already established a worldwide basis is of fandom, which has more than 100 million followers. I mean, routine, constant followers. They are really prosumers, not just consumers. So these prosumers are forming a sort of new cultural forces. Like, you know, you, we all remember the 1960s as a hippie movement, as a cultural uh, you know, icon of American pop culture. You know, just, you know, all these people, great rock singers and hard rock rockers singing together. That you have a resurrection of that nowadays in terms of how you send them or Korean popular culture send them all over the world. We have 100 million followers. So you're simply adding to these uh, fundamental power bases of pop culture and more and more people will join, particularly among men. Because before this, a parasite and uh, the squid game uh, boom, uh, most Hallyu fans were women. Uh, m my data shows about 90% or more uh, were pretty much women. But now, they, because of the impact of Parasite and uh, Squid Game, I think the male participation in this so-called Hallyu movement will increase substantially. So I will, my bet is there will be about 20 or 30% uh, male uh, fandom in the Hallyu movement, in addition to the you know 100 million uh, followers or less. <clears throat> yeah, that, that reminds me also uh, of BTS, which is now the number one musical band in the world. So that's a huge breakthrough there. I would imagine uh, most of the fans there are female as opposed to the Squid Game or more are male. But So Korea has the number one musical band in the world. That's unimaginable uh, in, in some respects. I didn't think that that would ever happen, but it has. And now it has the number one Netflix program ever as well so this is it's it's remarkable so um maybe we could talk a little bit for those of uh, our viewers who don't understand the hallyu movement and how has korea built up to this great success that they're experiencing right now with the squid game and bts and and uh, parasite it's it's phenomenal i would say uh, uh one big success factor for the korean cultural boom was what we call post-colonial conviviality project, which uh, the Japanese government uh, uh, invested a lot of money in, uh, or you know, tried to uh, promote as you know, as a gesture, friendly gesture between two countries, Korea and Japan. That started in early 2000s. If you remember 2002 World Cup soccer game between Korea and Japan. Oh yeah, that was fantastic. That was the yeah, there was the beginning year of what we call this friendly conviviality uh, program between the two countries. So the first Hallyu big success uh, happened in Japan. If you remember the Winter Sonata syndrome or, you know, Dejang. I was in Japan uh, when that was occurring. It was inc 
incredible. Exactly. So if you remember that, that was the beginning, and that was what we call conviviality program. So Korea, Japan, we become friends again culturally, although we can compete with each other economically or politically. So that program has succeeded a lot. I mean, if you remember Korea, Japan, political history and, uh, you know, economic history, it's all, you know, animosity, competition, it's still hatred everywhere. But in cultural aspect, cultural front, everybody's honky dory. Koreans and Japanese, they love each other, <laughs> they dance each other, they sing together, they produce, you know, movies and music programs together. You know, uh, Niju, for example, is a Korea-Japan combination of being a K-pop go band. So... In, in, the, in the cultural front, uh, there's a huge success between Korea and Japan uh, in terms of conviviality. And that conviviality, um, in, in Japan, if, if, you, if the, queen, the, queen, the group queen became popular globally because they were first popular in Japan, same thing as Chip Trick. Nobody heard about Chip Trick in the United States before they become so pow powerful in Japan. So Japan is a power basis in terms of popular culture. So if Japanese love, the world may love. Okay, there's huge chance that the, the world market will accept uh, any icons and uh, idols from the Japanese market. So they first went to Japan, it was big success for the last 20 years. Still number one biggest market for Korean pop culture is Jap the Jap Japanese market. So uh, based on the Japan success now, gradually moving into other parts of the world, and the United States, the last destiny, destination, because the United States has Hollywood, the United States has, has huge pop culture, pop music basis. So for Koreans, it was unimaginable to compete with America. But somehow, uh, several uh, young people, the, but the first big success was uh, Sai's Gangnam Style, if you remember that. Oh, of course. Gangnam Style, yes. So he was the first uh, Korean man who hit billboard number two uh, at that time. So gradually, more and more young people going to the States, and now they are kind of trying into the America. The biggest, largest, and most fierce, uh, you know, com most competitive pop market in the world. So it, it, I think it's, it will continue for a while. I remember uh, reading about ABBA back in the 1970s when... Um, when they were just hugely successful, that they were the number one export for the entire country of Sweden. They, they actually generated more revenue for the country than Saab did or uh, other Japanese or, or other Swedish manufacturers. Is, uh, is that happening now in Korea? Is BTS and Squid Game and the revenue that's being generated, is this the most important export? Is it bigger than Hyundai and Samsung and all of those other manufacturers? Not exactly, because uh, unlike the Swedish uh, music industry, the Korean K-pop music industry is in a very weak position because they have no rights to sell their music uh, globally because mostly, you know, BTS is owned by Sony Music, for example. So Sony has a lot of cash, you know, they rake in a lot of cash uh, because of BTS sales, album sales. Koreans produce mainly, they cannot distribute. So same thing with Netflix, you know, Koreans don't have drama distribution system, so they produce drama for certain fees. Uh, but Netflix, they, you know, they, they take the, the, the largest profit out of this, right? For example, uh, they, Netflix invested about $250 million, but they are now raking in more than $10 billion. So the huge difference between what Koreans earn and what the Americans earn or what the Japanese earn uh, in music. So. The, the industry will be small, okay, but uh, because it, Samsung is so huge, Hyundai is so huge, Korean industry, normal industry is so huge. So this is a, only a small fraction of Korean economy. So nonetheless, okay. this is a very welcoming situation. Yeah, it may, you, you may be uh, right. I, I think you're right about the revenue contribution. It may be small because the middleman... Uh, the producers. This is this has been true in the record industry for as long as I remember. And it's the artists get ripped off. The people who make the money are, are the Atlantic Records and you know Polydor and all of those people. But in terms of the influence, uh, I would imagine probably more young people know about BTS than they know about Samsung. 
right? So uh, in terms of cultural influence, it's it's well, bigger. Well, companies now using BTS to promote their products. So oh, they are okay. More. What's surprising is that Hyundai has, Hyundai Motor has never sold any car in Japan, but because of BTS nowadays, uh, Hyundai is coming back to Japan <laughs> to sell their cars for the first time in Korean history to sell at least one car in Japan. So that's what <laughs> <laughs> wow. So they're using uh, BTS as a as an entry now, and there are, I'm sure, many Japanese people would that would love to buy a car that's been endorsed by BTS. Or uh, my my students in my class, uh, not just uh, Asians, but uh, Europeans and Americans as well. They they love BTS. Thank you. We're running out of time. We just have one minute left. Is there anything that you'd like to wrap up with before we close the show? Well, uh, this has been a great opportunity to express some of my thoughts about this. But, uh, you know, there are so many misunderstandings about Korean pop culture, so we need to study more. Please tune into, you know, all the professionals, what they have to say about this Korean, instead of, you know, searching around the Internet and getting all the wrong rumors about Korean business of pop culture. Well, I'll Thank have you to have you... Fun. I'll have you back on the show again so we can correct the wrong impressions. This has been very interesting. Thank you all for tuning in to Looking to the East. Uh, the show will be on in a couple of weeks or so. We'll address another issue having to do with Japan or more broadly Asia. Um, those of you that are interested in supporting ThinkTech or this show in particular, please uh, consider making a contribution to the nonprofit organization ThinkTech Hawaii. Thank you, you so much. This is so interesting. And Thank you for the viewers for tuning in.